Good morning, everyone. I'm Tim Davenport Herbst. Welcome to worship with St. Paul Presbyterian Church in San Angelo, Texas. So we are excited to have you here with us today and grateful that we can share in celebrating today the ascension of Jesus Christ. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on into the service. Well, I have a couple of announcements to make. We have um, meals for the elderly. This is our week. If you are signed up to deliver meals for the elderly, please go ahead and make plans, set yourself a timer, a reminder, put it on your calendar, whatever you do, so that you don't miss out on doing that. We have a couple of committee meetings this week, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday night, with nurture and spiritual formation on Tuesday and stewardship on Wednesday, both at six o'clock, both on Zoom. Uh, we're gonna do food distribution this Saturday, May 22nd, and uh, that will be our last semi-monthly, that means twice a month, uh, food distribution. And then we're gonna go to monthly on the second Saturday of each month. And we hope that y'all will join in as we uh, feed people this weekend. And then in the coming months, that will go through October. And then we will be making plans uh, to uh, do Christmas boxes. We actually had our first discussion on that uh, and getting back to our regular signature mission program. I'm, one thing I wanted to just mention is uh, you may have noticed if you've been with us several weeks that we are singing a, a hymn by Hal Hobson, a good Presbyterian uh, called The Canticle of the Turning. I love it. It's one of those uh, in the style of the Appalachian music. Uh, and in case you didn't know, if you grew up mainline uh, anything, uh, then you were growing up exposed to Appalachian music. Those, uh, those beloved tunes, except for A Mighty Fortress uh, uh, that I think we're singing this morning, which is a German drinking song tune. Uh, most of that is uh, Appalachian music. And so we've been singing that because it's all about the world is about to turn, the world is about to change. And so I want you to be paying attention to that. I promise I'm not gonna have you sing it quite as often after we get back in person, um, but we, uh, it's, got a, it's got an important spiritual message for us and get used to it because on the day that we start in person, June 6th, we are going to be singing it. Uh, so make plans to have that tune in your head. And I think that's all that I have. Oh, reminder, COVID task force is meeting after worship this morning. So if you're on that, please stick around. Good morning, everyone. I'm Gretchen Smith, Director of Christian Ed. I uh, wanted to remind you that we have youth on Wednesday after school till about 530 and if you have a youth or kid interest in summer activities and camps, I have a packet of information, including scholarship forms that the scholarship forms need to be due me this week. Um, I can email them to the, you or drop them by. So just get in touch with me if you haven't gotten those yet. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Sunday morning. It is maybe rain, or if we're lucky, heading our way. What a joyful time to be together. I am Randy Hovlock, and I am going to be the liturgist for this week. And before we get started, I want to remind you that I'm going to be using the term in call worship, Selah, which means pause in Hebrew. So when I use that, we're just going to take a moment and think about the words that I just read. Please join me in the call to worship. From Psalm 47. Clap your hands. All you peoples, shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the most high is awesome and a great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. Selah. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with the psalm. God is the King over the nations, 
God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. Selah. Please join me in the prayer confession. Lord of all, oh. Lord of all, you left your throne behind as you descended. Just a minute. I can't see everything. There we go. <laughs> Lord of all, you left your throne behind and descended into our midst. You called us to care for our neighbors, but we put barriers between us. You told us to love ourselves, but we believed the lies of the world. You showed us that your love encompasses everyone, but we made church into a club. We saw you, but laughed at you. You invited us to come with you, but we nailed you to a cross. 
Forgive us, Lord. Heal us and make us new. Grant that we may truly become faithful disciples of Jesus Christ and join you in joyful life abundant. Amen. Friends, as people who have been forgiven by God, we are invited to forgive one another, to be kind and gracious to one another. Jesus has overcome all barriers between all people. And just as we have been made new, we are invited to have our relationships made new. I invite you to turn on your camera and to greet one another by holding up the peace sign and saying, peace be with you. With you. Hey, you two got to be together today. Wonderful. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. Peace be with each and every one of you. Would you please join me in prayer? Gracious God, we invite you into our midst, even though we know you are already here. Mostly, Lord, we invite ourselves to open up and to become conscious of your presence, your word, your grace, your love. We ask, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear, minds to understand, hearts to love, that you would enable us to hear your word and to become doers. Help us, Lord to apprehend you in this time, to hear what you are saying, and to be made new, as we might be salt and light, making the world new. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. I'm Carl Havlock, and I'll be reading the first reading from the book of Daniel. It is chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. As I watched in the night visions, I saw one son of man, a mortal human being, coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away. And his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone. I'm Gretchen Smith, Director of Christian Education here at St. Paul, and I'm so happy to share God's word with you this morning. When Tim assigns scriptures for me to speak from each week, it's usually some verses from the lectionary that make a good thematic pairing with either what he's preaching from or what, what theme it is for the week. It often typically comes with Reminders to keep it short, stay at a fifth grade level, short and sweet, so to speak. So this week, Tim goes off lectionary. He pulls apocalyptic eschatological redemption writings from the book of Daniel that are related to the Maccabean revolt. And I had to give him a hard time about it once I was done Googling those words to make sure I was using them all correctly. 
So let's talk about this book of Daniel for a bit, because while there are so many things in the book of Daniel that are like, yes, this is children's sermon material, chapter seven is not one of them. We know Daniel from being thrown into the lion's den, but before that, we've got this good story about his three friends being protected by God when they're thrown into the fiery furnace, right? Like the lion den story, it's this riveting adventure about the divine hand of God protecting the faithful who are standing up to his persecution and being faithful to God. There's also this really cool writing on the wall story. You've got these strange moving fingers at Belshazzar's feast that appear to these Babylonian elite who have decided to use the holy vessels that were looted from the destroyed temple to drink wine at a party. Daniel is called to interpret the meaning of these words. And these words tell the king that you have been weighed and you have been found wanting and your kingdom is about to end. This prophetic portent is ignored, but it does foretell the end of his empire, his dominion being given over to the Medes and the Persians, you know, his nearest and dearest enemies. While his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, who is of the fiery furnace fame, listened to the prophets and he humbled himself before God, Belshazzar really didn't have a chance to do that. He was killed that very night and Darius the Mede takes over his empire. This is the same guy who will later throw Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel himself, the prophet, he's an interpreter of dreams and later he dreams dreams of his own. He's a prophet. He does what prophets do. He is that shouting, uncomfortable voice that calls us back to accountability by reminding us both how far we've strayed from Torah, from the law and word of God, and also our actions. If we continue on this path, this is what this will lead to. Now, it doesn't take a, for a psychic to foresee that some of these foreign em empires of these foreign enemies will crumble. These kingships will all be destroyed. Belshazzar is not the only king who could really use to heed the writing on the wall. So we've got this book of Daniel. We've got this collection of stories that are warnings to leaders and they're heroic tales of God standing up for the faithful in the face of powerful, powerful enemies. And here we have this dream. This is the vision of a future leader who is going to set right all the political turmoil and reconcile man to God. Here it is Daniel himself watching the night visions. And later, the part, part we didn't read today, you'll see that Daniel, the guy who interpreted dreams for other people, after he had this dream, asks some other people for help to figure out what it means because it's just so vivid and so wild that he was like, am I reading this right? So as hard a time as I like to give to him about things, this is a beautiful text for Ascension Sunday. Not only because it is a very clear foretelling of the action that's about to come in the second scripture reading, but also these are familiar ear words to the ears of Jew. These are familiar words to the Jewish ears of Jesus's early followers. Because here's a bit of a shocking revelation for you guys. Jesus was not a 21st century Christian. Jesus was a Jew. He was talking to other Jews. Luke, the writer of Acts, is also a Jew talking to other Jews. Now, I am a Texan. I am talking mostly to other Texans. So if I'm going to describe Belshazzar to you, I wouldn't burst out with many, many, many tekel upsarim. I would tell you that this boy is all hat and no cattle. If I'm wanting to remind you of the great moments of the history of the people that inspired greatness, I would tell you to remember the Alamo, right? And if I'm trying to, if I'm in a room full of people and I'm trying to pick out who the true Texans are, there's only one test, right? I start out by singing, the stars at night are big and bright. Yes, thank you, Roseanne. And I wait to see who claps four times and follows it up with deep in the heart of Texas, right? Everything else that we include, nearly everything else that we include in our version of the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. But these chapters of Daniel are actually written in Aramaic. This is common language. This is ordinary folks. 
This dream to our modern Christian ears is a clear prophecy of the ascension. This one like a son of man who takes to the clouds of heavens to be presented to the ancient of days. Oh my goodness, what a fantastic image. This almost ordinary man with origins of clay, just like you and me. In this same whirlwind that took Elijah going to the eternal other world in the court of this vision of the old man God who is on the throne, who has always been and who is and will always will be throughout all of time and eternity to have dominion over all nations, all people with a kingship that cannot be destroyed. For Jews hearing and reading of this dream, it's a redemption act that they would have yearned for and hoped for for generations. This is a people who have suffered through slavery, nomadic wandering, bad kings of their own, foreign occupiers, exile, dispersion. This common language of ordinary folk, Daniel speaks to them of the hope that is to come. Daniel keeps it short and to a fifth grade level. When he speaks of a dominion that cannot be conquered, it cannot stray from the Torah. From the long look that we have in the rearview mirror, we criticize that they're waiting for a political leader and, and, and not the savior that we know. But the more I read about this people and their turmoil, the more I realize that yearning, this yearning perspective makes perfect sense. To be saved is a community act. And it's a communal act of salvation from the Darius and Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzars of their world. So in a few minutes, as you hear this passage from Act that is to be read next, Think about this. This is why those people who are gathered, these disciples are asking, is it time to restore the kingdom of Israel? To us, it seems like really strange timing. To them, it reflects generation upon generation of hope. These are words they know. This is the wish their people has longed for again and again. So imagine the excitement of these disciples standing with the resurrected Jesus, witnessing this moment that they have heard about and that their people have longed for for centuries. This moment where one like the Son of Man who comes to save us from conquering foreign oppressors as well as from our own selves ascends into the cloud of heaven to join in the dominion of the Ancient of Days.
Good morning. I'm Roseanne Girton, and I will be reading the second scripture, uh, Acts 1, 1 through 11. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Oh, sorry. I love art. Art is just gorgeous. I love looking at the way that different people have interpreted things over the years, through the centuries. And if you want to see some really cool art, you can see this with the Ascension. There is painting after painting. Some of them are all the way to the ceiling and the Vatican. They're just gorgeous. Having these pictures of Jesus ascending into heaven, going up. Now, I want to get you to think about Jesus' ascension, which is what we're celebrating today, because 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus is taken up into heaven, and then another 10 days is when Pentecost happens, although the disciples don't know that that's coming yet in the story. So Jesus is together with his disciples. He's met with them for 40 days. He's talked with them, and this is kind of his farewell going away speech. He's had several of these, actually. He's had, um, there are about three or four chapters in the Gospel of John, which are entirely now that I am going away to be crucified, here are the things I want you to know. Here are the things I want you to hold on to. But here he's kind of wrapping it all up, letting people know this is his last chance to talk about it. Jesus is ascending to heaven. And do you remember in the Apostles' Creed? He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead, right? And so we have these things in here. Ascension is all about Jesus going to heaven and ascending into power. The word that they actually sometimes use with this is exaltation. And there's exaltation where you feel really good. Uh, and it's not just exaltation, it's exaltation also. But there's also exaltation, which has to do with being lifted up, getting a reward. Uh, being looked at. You know, when someone gets the Congressional Medal of Honor, in some ways they are exalted, they are recognized. And Jesus is being exalted here and going and sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, the Ancient of Days in Daniel that we just read. So the thing I want you to get first off out of your heads is thinking about this in a literal way. Now, it is in too literal a way. Let me, just, let me say that. Um, in Jesus' day, they saw the world as having three different levels. The sky was the top, and it was lapis lazuli. And that was, you were looking up underneath the uh, palace of God in the sky, and that was all blue. That's why the sky was blue. Sometimes they would think about it as the waters above, and the waters beneath, and earth in the middle. So heaven is up for them. Now, we get into trouble if, with our scientific worldview and looking at things differently, we start thinking up. 
we get into ridiculous things, actually, if we start thinking about this. My parents could tell you stories about my hair my senior year. Yes, I was elected by my classmates, not as most congenial, most likely to succeed, or even most likely to get into trouble, but biggest hair. The reason I had biggest hair was because, uh, not because I was thinking about it, but because in September of my senior year, I sat down in the normal barber chair where I typically went and the hairstylist started telling me about how Jesus was coming back from whence he had come and from galactic north, you know, not, not north on the earth, not even up on the earth exactly, but galactic north. The new Jerusalem was coming from the sky with Jesus and people had seen it on earth. It was coming at the speed of light and forget for just a moment that you can't see anything traveling at the speed of light until it hits your eyes with light. This was making me very nervous, not just that this was a weird fundamentalist thing, but that she had sharp implements near my ear and neck. And I really did not feel safe with that. So I wasn't trying to make a statement or anything. I was just trying to keep away from the person who had sharp things near my face. You can get into really ridiculous places if you think about these things literally. You have to go figuratively. If we were going to retell this story today, in his day and age, it made sense for Jesus to ascend into heaven. In our day, we might think about him being captured in a portal about a, a space opening up to somewhere else and him going through it. And chances are a hundred years from now, that would make no sense to the people that came after us because the worldview will have changed again. The point is not where Jesus went, but that he was recognized for being Lord. This is the key word here, Lord. He is the one who is the judge. That's why we have that son of man. That's why I went off lectionary, as Gretchen pointed out, and pulled in the Daniel reading, because it's all about this phrase that Jesus uses. And this is lectionary year B, which means that we are in the gospel of Mark. And most of what you hear the rest of this liturgical year is going to be from the gospel of Mark. In Mark, Jesus talks about himself, not as the son of God, not as the Messiah, but as the son of man. Now, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because son of man in Hebrew is a, a way simply of saying a human looking person. It's, it's a human being. And so a lot of times people in order to get away from the sexism that goes into this will say the human one, but we're accustomed to hearing the son of man. So we're using that today just to think about this because the point is not that he's a son of a man, but that he looks human because Daniel sees coming from the sky down to earth to judge it, one who looks like a son of man, one who looks human. So I want you to keep that in your mind for the rest of this year as we go through the gospel of Mark. Every time you hear son of man, Jesus is being a little sassy and clever. He is both pointing out he's just a human being in some senses, and in another sense, he's also saying, I'm the one that comes to judge heaven and earth. And things are beginning to wrap up, kind of like the canticle of the turning that we keep singing, right? The world is about to turn. And this is part of what Jesus is saying. The world is about to turn. And so as the disciples are getting riled up just before Jesus leaves, they ask him, Lord, is this the time when you are going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They're still thinking too small. They're thinking that this is a political thing. They've been with him all along. They've heard his parables. They've seen him raised from the dead. But surely all of this ends with the Romans getting beaten up, sent away, and Israel going back to its glory days under King David. And Jesus doesn't even address their mistaken understanding. He just says, it's not for you to know the day and the time and the hour, not yours, but you will be my witnesses. It's an important piece there. And then he says, you have to stay 
in Jerusalem until with wind or breath or spirit, because the word can mean all of those, you are baptized, the holiness. And it doesn't actually say Holy Spirit. It kind of like divides up the words and puts the verb in the middle. So it's, it's like John baptized with water, but you're going to be baptized with this word that means breath or wind or air or also spirit, the Holy One. And so it's, it's a little confusing the disciples. We hear that and go, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You know, we all know Pentecostals who say in order to be saved, you have to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which means the speaking of tongues comes out of that. This is not there at all. These people have no idea what Jesus is talking about at this point. This is a weird thing. And that's why they're asking, what, what's next? What do we do? And Jesus says, stay in Jerusalem. Now, that's a difficult thing to do. You remember what happened last time they were in Jerusalem? Jesus got crucified. That's not a friendly place to go to. The crowd was riled up. The Roman authorities were turned against them. The Jewish authorities were turned against them. Their leader was killed. This is a dangerous place. And so they're wanting God to fix everything and make it all better. And Jesus says, nope, back into the mess you go. Back into this dangerous mess. And when the Spirit comes, you will be my witnesses. Now, I want to talk for just a minute, and um, hopefully Mary will not unmute herself and correct me on all of this, because I'm not an attorney, but I want to talk about witnesses and what I understand witnesses. And I already apologize and say, I'm not a lawyer. Speak to your own lawyer to know what witnesses actually are. But my understanding of witnesses, and this is the technical term of a witness in a legal proceeding back in the day. So when people come up to your door and tell you you need to convert, be baptized, be changed, believe something different, or you're going to hell, this is not actually witnessing. That's drawing conclusions. Witnesses do not draw conclusions. Witnesses share what they have experienced. What did you see? What did you hear? What did it smell like? What was your experience of something? Friends, your job is not to convert anyone. That's the Spirit's job. The Holy Spirit does that work. Your part of it, my part of it, is to share what we have seen and heard and experienced. We're not responsible for the conclusions somebody else draws. I had a friend who was terrified that if she did not tell everyone that she knew about Jesus, that she would be responsible for them going to hell at the time of the last judgment. And so that was why every opportunity she got, she went and she told people about Jesus and she tried to get them to say the sinner's prayer. This is not it. This is not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is saying, talk to somebody. They ask you what you've seen and heard. You say what you've seen and heard. You don't have to draw conclusions about it. You just share your own experience. And sometimes, guess what? Your perspective on things is going to be a little bit different from somebody else's. Have you read the four Gospels? Each of them tells the same story, but in a little bit different way. And sometimes the details even appear to contradict one another. Just the same way if you ask someone, what did Tim say? And we have all these people on the screen today, and chances are that half of what y'all say I said today, if anyone asks you about that, will be something I'm like, did I say that? I don't remember saying that. Did I say that? Someone help me out. And if you say something, someone else that's in this meeting, that's in watching and worshiping today, they're going to hear something else because different things come to us. That's okay. All we're responsible for is sharing what we have seen and heard. Jesus gives us two things that we're supposed to do. We are supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves. We're supposed to 
love uh, God with all of our heart, mind, and strength. And the way that's lived out is by following Jesus into the world and then being witnesses of what we have seen and heard. I like the way that Jews say this. They have this wonderful expression called tikkun olam. It's similar to what we mean by the kingdom of heaven because it is about the perfection of the world, the consummation of the world. And the saying is the perfection of the world is not your responsibility, but neither are you free to abandon the work. The perfection of the world is not your responsibility. Let me say that to all the type A folks out there. The perfection of the world is not your responsibility, but neither does that set you free to abandon the work. We still get to work alongside Jesus. We still get to do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with our God. These are all good things. And for each of us, as we live it out in our lives, these are going to be different because where you sit and where you live and what you do is different from me. And so it looks a little bit different. And that's good. And that's okay. You are not responsible for the conversion of the world. That's not your problem. That's God's problem through the Holy Spirit. I think it's really helpful sometimes to be able to say, this is my problem, this is not my problem. I have friends who say, not my monkeys, not my circus, right? The whole idea is you're not responsible for all the things that happen out there. You're not responsible for deciding what we should do about having Russians hack the Southeast pipeline in the US, not your responsibility. You are not responsible for the conversion of the person that you work next to. You are not responsible for fixing everything in your family, in your family, in your house, in your nation, in your community. God has given you something to do. Work on that. That's what it means to follow Jesus as Lord. Amen. Set 
yourself a place God, thank you for that, Kim. That was beautiful. <laughs> we got a little bit of feelings from there. Now we've entered a time of offering. God has given us everything. In this time, we think about how we can give back and say thanks for what God is doing for us. You can give with money online or through the mail, but we ask you at this time to also think about how you can give back to God this week, your times and talents. Please join me in the prayer of dedication. Creator God, lover of all of our souls, we thank you and we praise you for this reminder today of the divine mystery of you. We thank you and we praise you that you were well aware of how little control we have and gave us problems that we are responsible for. And you take the big problems for yourself. Thank you, God, for loving us and knowing us. 
help us to love ourselves better and know ourselves more. Thank you for being with us as we walk this week and help us to separate that which we are in control of and that which we leave to you. Help us to use our time and talents to spread your love and to separate things beyond our control into your hands. Amen. Friends, I invite you to come inside God's grace and set yourself a place. Come to the table, find whatever you have that will work for communion elements, or if you don't have them with you, then I invite you to imagine it in your head and make that a part of your action and your prayer. This is God's table, not a Presbyterian table. It's my, not my table or even your table. It is God's table, and God invites everyone to come and to be fed at this table. I want to remind you, even if you feel unworthy, Jesus shared this meal with Judas moments before he was betrayed. And do you think Jesus didn't know who he was sharing a meal with? Friends, all are welcome. The pious, the impious, those who think they are perfect, and those who know that they are wrong. Friends, come. Come inside God's grace and be fed. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Wondrous and holy God, it is truly right to give you thanks and praise, and we worship and glorify you, and we love you, and we give thanks for all of your many blessings. You pursued us down the lanes of history, never giving up on us, always calling us back, sometimes pushing us hard, sometimes bidding us come, but always and always being jealous for us and persevering in your love for us. We give you thanks that in the fullness of time, when the right time had come, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, into this world that you might truly share in our life completely. We give you thanks, God, that he walked among those that the society called sinners and he held court with those who were considered saints, that he sat at table with those no one else would reach out to, that he reached out and touched the lepers who had not been touched. We give you thanks, God, that we got to see what love made flesh looks like in him. And that when the time had come, he stretched out his arms and died for us. But you did not leave him in the grave, but raised him up to never ending life. And we thank you, Lord, that Jesus is Lord. That this world is under the lordship of love. That love is at the center of all things that your grace, your peace, your hope, your care unites and binds us and keeps us together as one. Pour out now your Holy Spirit upon us, upon these gifts that we bring before you, that the bread that we break and the cup that we bless might truly be a communion in your body and blood, your very being. We pray these things in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body. This is my very life given for you. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he blessed it. And he gave it to them saying, this cup is the cup of the new covenant shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, do these things remembering me. friends." These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, for all is prepared. Josh, the bread from heaven and the cup of salvation.
Friends, would you join me in prayer and let us give thanks for all the ways in which God feeds us and cares for us. Gracious and holy Father, thank you that you feed us and nurture us, that you love us, that you care for us, that you have fed us with your very life. Thank you, God, that you live within us and that we live within you. Grant, grant that every step that we take, every word that we speak, everywhere that we go, we may be aware of your presence and may speak and act in ways that bring glory to you by shedding your love abroad. We lift up to you, God, those things that are near and dear to our hearts, those things that worry us, those things that wonder us, and we give them over to you, praying for the sick and the hurting, for the direction of nations, for warfare and drought, for hunger and thirst. And hear us now, Lord, as we join our voices together praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, if you're a COVID task force, I remind you to stick around and we will have our meeting in a few minutes after the benediction. And once I pronounce the benediction, you are welcome to turn your cameras on and Mike will tell us when we are no longer streaming and we can talk to one another. So may the love of God our Father, the grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you, now and forever. Amen.